Right, so today we will go on with our study of uh, phase transitions and uh, we will have a gentle introduction to what is called the Landau theory. Now, I am not going to do this, we do not have time to do this in great detail or in, in, at any length, but what we are going to do is to take off from uh, a familiar model, namely the Ising model which we have already looked at and then I will simply make a statement that a very large class of phase transitions will fall under the so-called Ising universality class. So whatever happens here is generic to whatever happens in general and I will use the same symbols that we use for the Ising problem. In other words, the order parameter is a magnetization. I use a little m for that. We will continue to do that. But the physical significance of this m could change from problem to problem and you will see that the structure of the theory is more or less generic, it is quite general. And then we will go on to some introduced fluctuations and go on to what is called the Ginzburg-Landau theory and hopefully finally we will talk about dynamic critical phenomena. So we take this in several steps. Let us start uh, with some familiar material and it is as follows. I uh, will draw a number of pictures today to show you what uh, the phase transitions, what, what uh, various diagrams, phase diagrams look like. So wherever um, the algebra gets a little unnecessarily complicated, we will simply draw a picture and go ahead with things. And there will be a lot of uh, hand waving arguments which can be made rigorous, but I want to communicate the essential physics of what we are talking about. So we start again with the Ising model for which if you recall, we had an equation of state. Mm? So we had uh, an equation of state. for the Ising model and we are dealing now with the critical region. We, we are looking at the region uh, near the critical point. Okay. If you recall, the critical point is the characterized by a temperature Tc, the Curie temperature at which the system goes from paramagnetic to ferromagnetic. A critical value of the field which is equal to 0 in this case because it is at 0 field that you cross over from a paramagnet to a ferromagnet, the spontaneous magnetization is in the absence of the field and of course the critical value of the magnetization is also 0 because it takes off from 0. Now just to recall to you uh, what these, uh, what the diagrams were in this case, I plot an H versus M, then the critical isotherm did this. isotherm, critical isotherm. So Hc was 0, M sub C was 0 okay. and then we also had a figure, uh, let me draw this again then just to recall to you, we had M versus T and here is Tc in this case and the magnetization in the absence of a field M0 was 0 beyond T above Tc and then it went down like this or the ferro down was a branch like this and this branch became unstable. So this was M0, the spontaneous magnetization and again by critical region I mean this region just as I mean this region, critical region and finally there was the H versus T graph and the H versus T graph was a line like this and then a TC. So again this is the critical region. So HC was 0 and TC is at this point here. So it is this circle region that we are dealing with, we are talking about and what happened in this circle region was that in the Ising model, 
in mean field theory we ended up getting an equation of state and that equation of state read like this. We had tan hyperbolic h over k t but essentially in the critical region h is near 0. So, it was h over k t was equal to m minus tan hyperbolic m t c over t divided by 1 minus m tan hyperbolic m t c over t. Now, we are going to focus on the critical region namely t near the critical temperature. So, let us introduce the reduced temperature t equal to t minus t c over t c. Then I can write this equation here in terms of critical quantities very close to the critical region in terms of little t and little m. M minus M C is the same as M because M C is 0. H minus H C is again just H because H C is 0. Okay. So, this equation can be written in the form on this side M T that is the leading term and then the next term is of order M cubed and then plus order T M cubed. So, we will drop this it is a higher order term. The spontaneous magnetization is found by putting h equal to 0 in this and then the equation is m cube plus m t is equal to 0. So, you have m cubed is minus m t, m equal to 0 is always a root but for t less than t c that is unstable and for t negative namely t less than t c out here this region m squared is equal to t mod t was the solution and therefore, you got plus or minus square root of little t out here. So, that was the mechanism. Okay. Now, we want to make this systematic and one way to do this is to argue and this is Landau's argument it proceeds in a large number of steps. So, let me say what it was start with one way to look at it is to say there is probably there is it is possible to introduce a potential after all this equation of state has essentially arisen by saying some thermodynamic potential is at a minimum. So, that you are in thermal equilibrium in this case essentially the equivalent of the Gibbs free energy because we have an H here the analog of the pressure and we have the analog of the volume out here and the temperature that is the equation of state. So, at a given value of the magnetic field H 0 or otherwise it is equivalent to saying at a given value of the pressure and temperature. So, it is equal to the Gibbs free energy. We are not going to write that down. Let us go back and do a bit of phenomenology and say essentially this is the equation that I have. So, I understand from this equation how you get this square root here. The same equation gave us this cubic here the same equation gave us the susceptibility also remember that we plotted the susceptibility as a function of t I plotted the isothermal susceptibility and it diverged at the point t c like 1 over little t all these things came out of this equation of state here. So, let us do the following let us introduce some potential on differentiating that potential with respect to m and setting the result equal to 0 I get this equation of state. You could call it the Landau functional or something like that. Mm. So, this potential it is not exactly the Gibbs free energy it is not exactly the uh, Helmholtz free energy because those things have to satisfy certain convexity properties these potentials do not this is just an empirical uh, this is an equation of state at the critical region. So, let us define a phi which is a function of m t and h equal to some constant phi naught which is a function of t and h does not involve m does not involve m and I want to produce this equation of state. So, minus m h let me just for convenience 
you could write this T as T c plus a small correction. The correction is a higher order correction. So, it is essentially T c here and we can subsume it in H. So, let us it is not an essential factor here. Mm -hmm. I have already done that. See, you see, I have already got a TC here. This is essentially TC because if I multiply through, it is going to the correction T minus TC is going to give me higher order terms. It is going to be of order T, that correction. No, it will be of order T squared. It will be of order T squared. Because if I write this as T c plus little t essentially and I take that little t across there it goes away, only the T c part contributes. The next term is of order little t squared which I have neglected. So, uh, no, the question is I am asking about smallness. Yeah. So, we are keeping m to order m cube. Right. So you need that. Yeah, I know that. But uh. the question is that there can be a term of your m little t square. Yes. Okay. You have to ah. Okay. Good question. You have to check, and I'm not going to do this here. You have to check that it's consistent to subsume this t here and call it just t c. Yes. Good. Good exercise. Check that. Like I've neglected this term, for instance. Okay. It depends on how they scale, right? Like exactly. Exactly. They have worked out beta. Yeah. Exactly. So this is the consistent. Okay. This term is not relevant. It's, I call it h. Okay. So if you do this, minus m h plus t m squared. It's this this term here. Plus m four, and then you compute delta phi over delta m and you set it equal to 0, you get precisely this. Here. Uh, put a 2 here, put a 4 here if you like. These are constants which I am not paying attention to. So, do you agree that if I take this uh, phi and I differentiate with respect to m and set it equal to 0? If you like, yeah. If you like, hmm? if you like. If I set delta phi over delta m equal to zero, I get this equation here, right? So my claim is that this potential, whatever it is, this phi, has a certain geometric shape, and its minimum will give me the equilibrium state. We can plot that, we can plot that fellow in all directions. I am going to generalize that. This is the original Landau functional. We are going to, the point is eventually what I am going to argue is that the factors here, the signs are very important. There could be numerical factors which I am not bothered about. So I am going to have a term which is proportional to the product of the order parameter and the field then a term proportional to the square of the order parameter with a little t in the coefficient as a leading coefficient and then a term which is essentially a constant coefficient times the fourth power of the order parameter. That will generically give me this second order, this continuous phase transition yeah. and it will generate for me all these diagrams. So that is the idea. And then I am going to argue that uh, these coefficients could in general be temperature dependent, but we have looked at the leading temperature dependence near the critical point. Okay. So let us draw some pictures and see what happens. Uh, notice also that you could do the same thing with fixed field. Suppose you plotted the magnetization versus T for small positive field. Then the curve would be this is the paramagnetic region and then this would be the furrow region eventually it would saturate. Similarly, on the negative side, a small negative field, if you do not switch it off, will behave in this fashion. So, what you are doing is drawing these isotherms for non zero value, these various isotherms, and looking at what happens as you change, keep H fixed, and you de decrease the temperature from above Tc to below Tc. So, as you go up here, 
or as you go down here on this side. In the case of the magnetization versus temperature, it means if you keep the field fixed at some positive value, you are here at this point and as you change the temperature, you come down for a fixed value of the field, you are going to jump this and make a transition here as you, as you change the field from positive to negative values, keeping the temperature constant, you are going to jump here. That is equivalent to saying if I go from here to here, keeping the temperature constant, I cut across this phase transition line. That is like the liquid gas coexistence line and there is a discontinuous change in the magnetization from this point to this point. So this is a line of discontinuous transitions ending in the critical point where the transition becomes continuous. In other words, the discontinuity in the magnetization keeps decreasing till it vanishes at the critical point, which is why it is called a continuous transition, okay. Now that is going to be encapsulated in the figures that we can draw. We can now draw, ask what, do, what does this potential look like in various cases. So let us draw these poten this potential. So let us draw, let us have uh, T greater than Tc, T equal to Tc and then T less than Tc. Let us draw these three cases separately and let us draw them for H equal to 0, 0 feet. So this fellow is gone hmm? and I am going to draw phi minus phi naught. Okay. So this is just a constant as far as M is concerned. I move it aside and plot this graph here. So I have Tm squared plus M4. And that is now easy to see what is going to happen for T greater than Tc. So I plot phi minus phi naught always here and what does the potential look like as a function of m always the order parameter m. Then at h equal to 0 this is gone. T greater than Tc, this is positive, this coefficient starts with a parabolic behavior and then takes off like a fourth power. Huh? So the minimum is a simple minimum, it is not quite a parabola but it is like this for T greater than Tc. Huh? At T equal to Tc, the same thing as a function of m little t is 0 now and the field is 0. So you have a pure quartic term. Therefore this looks like a very flat and t less than tc you have an inverted parabola. The field is 0 and then you have the m4 which takes you up. So let me plot with uh, a cross or dot the equilibrium value which is the state of thermal equilibrium and it will give you the order parameter at thermal equilibrium. It is obviously 0 here, it is still 0 here but now it is either this or that. These are the two values of the spontaneous magnetization that you saw in the M versus T, M naught versus T graph either up or down, if you are up or down. This is for H equal to 0. So let us plot the same things, let us take this up a bit t greater than Tc, t equal to Tc, t less than Tc. Let us plot the same thing for h small positive on this side. Okay. Now h is positive, this fellow is positive. So near the origin you have a linear behavior with a negative slope. So this curve for T greater than Tc looks like something like this because near the origin you have this thing. Then you can find the minimum by working that out by taking its minimum there. Hmm? T equal to Tc, what happens at T equal to Tc in this case? But H is positive. T equal to Tc, this fellow goes away. 
and you still have a curve which looks like this, it changes shape here a little bit. So, this guy gets a little flatter and then it does this. And for T less than T c, what does it do? It will still be like that, but it will be, it will bias it towards this. So, near the origin, if h is less than 0, there is a linear term. So, essentially, there is a thing like this. and there is something like that, bias towards the positive side. So, the absolute minimum is still here on the positive side. Hmm. On the other hand, for h less than 0, for h less than 0, for t greater than t c, you have a positive slope here and, and t greater than t c that follows still a square and so on, it will be simply a reflection. Something like that, that is the equal thing and it will do the same thing, it will come down and then broaden out a little, do this crazy thing. Again, it is on the negative side, but now for h less than 0 and t smaller than t c, we will have this slope, but we will have a deeper, deeper minimum and we will have a negative thing here. This side. So, at t equal to t c, we have seen what happened already positive slope, I mean po po h positive, you have a minimum at a positive value, h negative, you have a minimum at a negative value, at T c, you have this at 0, right. So, this corresponds to, what do these three graphs correspond to? They correspond in this h versus m graph, on the critical isotherm, you are describing this point, this point and this point that is the critical isotherm. So, on this thing case, you are describing this point here corresponds to this minimum, this value it passes through corresponds to this flat minimum and this value here corresponds to this minimum. On the other hand, when you go to T less than T c here, you are going through a first order phase transition because now you are looking at this, here is T, here is T c and you had the spontaneous magnetization curve like this and then you had the other curves in the presence of small positive and negative fields like this, but now T is less than T c. So, you are to the left of this curve, you are going like this as you are going from positive to negative values of the field. So, you are really crossing, this is m, if you do this in the t versus h graph, you had this graph with t c, you are crossing this line, you are going through a first order phase transition from a positive magnetization to a negative magnetization. So, the way the free energy graph or the energy function or the Landau functional changes shape is first you have a graph with two minima, but this is the global minimum and therefore, the equilibrium state is a positive value of magnetization. At the critical value at T c, the two minima are equal and below for negative fields, the left hand side minimum becomes more pronounced than the top. So, there is this exchange of stability that has happened in some sense. So, from this minimum, you went to a case where equally probable and then this became lower. So, you went from here to here, discontinuously crossing this line here, okay. So, you can see that uh, this generic form 
already encapsulates in it all that is happening here both the first order transition below the uh, critical point as well as the critical region itself hmm, within mean field in the simplest of approximations. Okay. So, the way to generalize this is now uh, deep very deep this is such a generic thing that one starts by saying that now let us look at uh, this picture in general we still not introduced any fluctuations. Remember that uh, the, the, the crucial point the assumption was that we had a term in the Hamiltonian which looked like i j j i j s i s j. So, the Hamiltonian was this minus h times summation over i s i and I wrote this as equal to minus summation h i s i over i where h i was equal to summation j equal to nearest neighbor of i j i j expectation s j out here plus h applied field. So, essentially I replaced the expectation of this term by S i by, by or this term by S i times expectation S j. In other words I neglected the fluctuation in S j. So, essentially I wrote S j equal to S j plus S j minus S j and neglected this in mean field theory that is really what has happened I neglected the fluctuations ok. So, we have still we have not going we have not taken that into account really. So, we are within mean field theory in this uh, in this model mean field theory simply means this nothing more than that and we got an m which is spatially independent of where you are in the lattice it is completely homogeneous etcetera etcetera. We will subsequently put in spatial dependence a little bit later because we want to include fluctuations in some sense. Okay. But the original Landau theory itself starts by saying that for a given problem with an order parameter, I introduce a functional phi which as a power series in the order parameter is something like summation n equal to 0 to infinity in principle some coefficients c n which are functions of the set of all the exchange constants the field and all the other parameters. So, it is functions of all these quantities multiplied by oh times temperature etcetera multiplied by m to the power n this is the order parameter. So, I construct such a functional out here and now I ask what are the possible values of n ok. So, if I re were to write this out this would be of the form C naught plus C 1 times m plus C 2 times m squared plus C 3 times m cubed plus C 4 times m 4 plus dot dot dot. Now, as far as uh, the critical region is concerned we have seen that all that you need is to keep up to the fourth order term in it you do not need anything else. So, we are trying to describe that sort of phase scenario here. So, first step this is replaced by 4. So, we do not have to go beyond that. Second point this is a constant and we can drop it it is not doing anything when I differentiate etcetera etcetera. So, this is a harmless constant, but this term here k 
cannot exist because if it existed, it would say that there is a solution m not equal to 0 above T c because if I differentiated this fellow here, I would end up with the constant term here, right. So, in the potential, you cannot have a term which is linear in the order parameter. Look at how what happened there because if you did, you can easily check for yourself that if you had such a term in the potential, if I differentiate delta phi over delta m and put it equal to 0, I would get a constant C 1 independent of m which would not go away even above T c. So, it would end up with a solution for m not equal to 0 above T c which we do not want because we have started by defining our phase transition as such that the order parameter is 0 above the critical point and non 0 below the critical point. So, this term goes away. These terms exist, but now the argument is ah, wait, now this is with h not equal to with uh, for for h for h set equal to 0, no c 1 if h equal to 0, yeah, I should say that. If h is not 0, then of course there is a linear term that is very much there, that is what is giving you the susceptibility and so on. Yes, we are going to do that in a second. The reason I am singling this out is because you want this. If h is equal to 0, this is definitely got to be 0 because by the very statement that the order parameter is 0 above the critical point. Okay. Then the next point is that in the absence of the field, I want to have symmetry between m and minus m. You saw all these figures, all that happened was m and m minus m got exchanged as you made the first order transition. Since you want to retain that symmetry, this term is 0 because you want this thing to be invariant under m goes to minus m. you can couch this in fancier language. You can say that the probability of a given configuration is e to the minus beta times phi and phi of m must be equal to phi of minus m otherwise the probabilities will change in the absence of a symmetry breaking field, okay. So then you have this and you have this and now we have seen that these coefficients could be temperature dependent themselves. So this term here would be some C2 uh, 2 naught plus C 2 1 T plus C 2 2 T squared plus dot 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 etcetera. So, we, we require it to be analytic function of T? Yes, we have assumed that it is analytic in the coefficients and all these exchange constants in the field and in the order parameter. I am not saying this is a conversion power series, you are going to truncate it at a finite time, a finite uh, point and 4 in fact, etc. Okay. So, this term has to be 0 because the only way in which you can get this phase transition critical point is for this term to change sign as you cross little t equal to 0 as you cross T c, which means the leading term must be 0 out here and it must start with the term proportional to t as indeed is the case here. It is because this term change sign that you had solutions for m which are not equal to 0 plus or minus square root of minus mod t to the half um, um, of mod t to the half you got that because there was a linear term there. So, this term is 0 in any case and we retain only this term. Okay. Then similarly C 4 will also have a C 4 0 plus C 4 1 times t plus C 4 2 times t squared dot 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 dot. Now, the only role of that fourth power term is that you want stable minima. So, when m becomes very large in the positive or negative side, you want the well to point up the concave upwards rather than downwards. So, for stability, thermodynamic stability, you want this to have a positive coefficient. And the temperature dependence of it is not very significant. So, you may as well retain only this term and throw out all these terms. Okay. And you end up with precisely this. 
on here. So, now let us write that in kind of uh, fancy notation. So, we are going to take phi equal to some constant phi naught minus m h plus now we use standard notation a t m squared plus half b m 4. This is the Landau uh, potential. and all the information I want comes out of this potential. All right. Now the question is, uh, what is the guarantee that this mean field is valid? If so, when is it valid? We need to know when this uh, thing is valid. Well, let us ask that question separately. Let us ask We are going to put in all the information that we already have in this business. I have already said that all these critical exponents come from just the correlation function, essentially the behavior of the correlation function. That is the correct way to look at this. So I am going to use that information without actually proving it. We have said certain things about this correlation function. I am going to use that without actually using, without actually proving it in some sense. So I would say that it is valid as long as you can neglect fluctuations. Okay. Now when can you neglect fluctuations? Because what is really happening is that the system is correlated. You cannot say all the spins are independent within some correlation length xi. And we also I mentioned that the xi diverges as you hit the critical point, right. So if you recall we had a g which I called ri minus rj. And I call this SI SJ minus SI SJ, this fellow here, right? Product of expectations. Ah, sorry, product of expectations. And the non zero nature of this G probes fluctuations, beca correlations, because if this is completely uncorrelated, then this thing would be zero identically, right. So a good measure of this and we also saw several properties of this, I related this to the susceptibility, static susceptibility and so on, right. Now a measure of this would be to say that if within a correlation length you compare this quantity to the magnetic magnetization itself namely to the factored form below. So divide this by SI SJ and compare how big this is compared to this guy, okay. That will give you some idea of how accurate this mean field theory is. So if this ratio is much, much less than 1, I would say this is the error, relative error in this quantity and that is a good measure of uh, the fluctuations, right. So that would be one way of uh, doing this. Let us sum over this i and j in any case. So finally, this whole thing reduces to the following. An integral in d dimensions, so let me be in work in d dimensions, spatial dimensions, d, d, r and then this is g of r which is mod xi mi, si minus x, sj, etc. We computed this quantity, okay. Divided by integral d, d r, m squared of r. So I have coarse grained in the volume of uh, size, linear size the correlation length and I am comparing the two. So I got to integrate over a volume 
over a volume V where V is of order xi to the power d. Yeah. We are going to sum over i and j on top and then below and find out what is the relative error in this whole business. Okay. So that is how I get this. Okay. And the volume of integration is not the whole sample, I do not need to do that. I find out within one correlation link because outside it the correlation is 0 anyway essentially. So I need to compute this quantity. But notice that we computed this quantity and showed that it was essentially the susceptibility, right. So this uh, thing goes to chi t uh, susceptibility on top, that is essentially what it is, right? divided by The magnetization it could be taken to be constant inside a correlation's length, and it is this value m, whatever this is. And we know that in the critical region it goes like t to the beta, that is the magnetization index. So let us write that out effectively. This is t to the minus gamma mod t, let us put modulus is everywhere, mod t to the minus gamma divided by this factor is t to the 2 beta because the magnetization exponent was beta the square root of half in mean field theory and this gives me t to the 2 beta and then a volume in d dimensions of linear size xi. So this is xi to the d. So apart from constants of order 1, this thing is mod t to the minus gamma divided by, we know that xi itself goes like t to the minus nu, it diverges. So mod t to the 2 beta minus nu d. This must be much, much less than 1 as t goes to 0. Then you are safe in neglecting fluctuations. So where does that get us? It says 1 is much, much greater than 1 over mod t to the power or rather let us write it like this, mod t to the power 2 beta plus gamma minus mod t to the 2 beta plus gamma minus nu d must be much, much greater than 1 as t tends to 0. That means this exponent must be negative. nu d. Hmm? Or d greater than 2 beta plus gamma over nu. So only if the spatial dimensionality is high enough is this correct. Okay. This must be high enough in any given problem. If it is equal to or less, then fluctuations are very important and the smaller it is, the fluctuations get more and more important. Okay. This quantity, this, it is called the upper UCD, it is called the upper critical dimensionality. Not 
actually putting in the values of beta, gamma, nu, what? Not is yet, it? not yet. But it just says that there exists something called an upper critical. Yes. So it says that in any of these critical phenomena, whenever you have a critical point, then depending on what kind of universality class you have, there exists an upper critical dimension above which you may as well work in mean field theory because the fluctuations are relatively unimportant and vanish in the thermodynamic limit. Okay. They do not affect the exponents or anything like that. Okay. Now let us check what it is for the Ising problem because we have an answer in mean field theory. In mean field theory in our problem we had beta equal to half, gamma equal to 1 because magnetization went like plus or minus square root of T minus T C minus T in the critical region. The susceptibility went like 1 over T minus T C. This is the Weiss, uh, Curie Weiss law. So gamma was 1 and nu was equal to a half in this case. So we have 1 plus 1 divided by half which is 4. So that is the reason you find this statement made in standard textbooks in critical phenomena that in d greater than equal greater than 4 dimensions uh, the fluctuations are unimportant. Okay. Obviously we live in 3 and we have 2 dimensional magnets. So it gets more and more significant. The deviation from the mean field exponents will become more and more significant as d becomes further and further away from the upper critical dimensionality. There is however a lower critical dimensionality below which the uh, critical point itself vanishes. I mean you do not have a critical point, you do not have a phase transition at all because the disorder can never be overcome by the interaction. The effect of entropy is too strong. In the Ising model the de lower critical dimensionality is 2. So in less than 2 dimensions you do not have a phase transition. In greater than 4 dimen spatial dimensions mean field theory is good enough but the interesting physics lies in 2 and 3 it is very very non trivial in 2 and 3 okay and that seems to be more or less the case always that so somewhere we should think that we are doing this computation starting from a higher dimension so that we can trust our mean field effect. right exactly so you have to so the question the point is when we computed mean field and we found the phase transition it said that it predicted a phase transition in every dimensionality. It did not say anything at all. I mean it said independent of D, D did not appear at all. So that was, a, that was wrong. Mean field theory overlooks that. We know the critical dim, uh, exponents are very dependent on the dimensionality whereas the mean field theory completely ignores that altogether. Okay. So experimental evidence rules out. Uh, the possibility that mean field theory is correct for the Ising model. We know that it is wrong. We can compute in two dimensions. We can compute. Uh, but the question here is that we, uh, so we start from top, we get yeah. the correct data. Gamma, nu. But now in 3, we will get beta prime, gamma prime, nu prime. Yeah. But the upper critical dimension still, if it ceases, if you try to go from below, what is it? Yeah. If you do the renormalization group, you will see the thing uh, at 4 and above at um, greater than 4 mean field mean field exponents are exact so exponents. Even from below that oh yeah, 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 are exact. Now it is a question of whether you, uh, you know, what sort of uh, accuracy you want. We have perturbation methods, we have this uh, d minus 4 minus epsilon expansions and so on. We need to keep a sufficient number of terms to get a reasonable results, etc. So the computation of the critical exponents for d less than upper critical dimensionality is hard. You could ask what happens at the critical dimensionality itself. Typically of all these cases, very typically, there will be logarithmic corrections. So the corrections are not power law corrections but log corrections, etc. Similarly, you could ask what is the critical region? How small should t be? I have said t going to 0 but how small should it be? That is called the Ginzburg criterion and I will talk about it next time. We will see how, how small it should be in order for this to happen. By the way, this whole thing is uh, the whole renormalization group uh, approach to critical phenomena started off with a lot of empirical observations on scaling exponents 
Now, let me just write those down since we are not going to use them anywhere, I need to write them down so that you may have that at the back of your mind. Yeah. So, before that, hmm. so does that imply that we can always say 2 theta plus gamma minus mu d is equal to 4? Is that a correct statement? For the Ising model. For the Ising universality. For the Ising universality class, yes. For other universality classes, all the mean field itself is different. The Ising universality class includes the Van der Waals kind of model because those are identical to this. They are in the same universality class. So they all have to do with an order parameter which is a scalar. If you looked at the Heisenberg ferromagnet, the order parameter is a three-dimensional vector and then you are finished. It is a different class. If you looked at the XY model, the order parameter is a two vector moving in a plane with two components and that is different, etc. So I said that it depends on the spatial dimensionality, it depends on the dimensionality of the order parameter, number of components and it depends on the range of the interaction. Basically these are the only things that govern which universality class a given Hamiltonian belongs to. Okay. Now what has been found is that in the critical region and this is how it started in the 1960s, the whole theory of scaling, a lot of uh, these functions of several variables were found to be scale invariant in the sense that they were generalized homogeneous functions. They were functions of combinations of the independent variables, okay. And they led to a lot of empirical scaling relations which today we can justify by somewhat more rigorous methods. Let me just write them down so that you have uh, some information. Uh, the first of this, so let me, let me call it scaling laws. between critical exponents. <coughs> uh, first of all, I said that everything is dependent on the correlation function. So we really need to see what the correlation function does so that we can have this quantity g of r, basically si, sj, minus, etc., etc., this quantity went like e to the minus r over xi and then I mentioned what it did at the critical point. This was xi to the power d minus uh, r to the power d minus 1 over 2, xi to the power d minus 3 over 2. Uh, this is for r much, much greater than xi and at the critical point at reality, it goes like 1 over r to the d minus 2 plus eta, okay. And remember we defined a critical exponent for this guy. We also found that xi goes like mod t to the minus mu. So two exponents are introduced in the correlation for a function. One is the way it diverges at the critical point in the critical region and the second is what happens to the correlation which changes from an exponentially damped function to a pure algebraic function, a power law, inverse power. This eta is called the non-classical exponent because if you did mean field theory, eta is 0. So let me also write down mean field values in this problem. MFT values, mu equal to half, eta equal to 0, okay. Now what the scaling relations tell you are the following. It is a set of four relations so that all the exponents are written in terms of eta and mu. So the first is called the Rushbrook equality in this case, alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma is equal to 2. This is the specific heat exponent. The specific heat goes like 1 over mod t to the power alpha. This is the magnetization or the order parameter exponent. This guy here is the susceptibility exponent. The second relation says 2 minus alpha equal to nu d. 
This is called hyperscaling well, for a reason which I will just mention in a second. So, if you give me the dimensionality of space and you give the, of the system that you are working with and nu, then I give you alpha, the specific heat exponent. And then beta plus gamma equal to beta delta. Delta is the critical isotherm exponent, okay. And then the next one is gamma equal to nu times 2 minus eta. So, with the help of these relations, you can express everything in terms of nu and eta. Okay. And what do the mean field values do? MFT values. It says nu equal to half, eta equal to 0. It says alpha equal to 0. It is a finite discontinuity. Mean field predicts a finite discontinuity in jump discontinuity in the specific heat. Beta equal to half, gamma equal to 1, delta equal to 3. What happened here? You notice that all these relations are valid with these values. Hmm? Alpha plus 2 beta plus gamma is 0, plus 1 plus 1 is 2, beta plus gamma half plus 1 is 3 halves, this is 3, this is half. This guy is 1, this is 0, this is half, this is 2, this is 1. But this, this gets violated by these numbers. Notice that this is the only law, only scaling relation which is dependent on the dimensionality. All the others are independent of the dimensionality, but this depends on the dimensionality. Now, this mean field values are valid only above the critical dimensions, upper critical dimensionality. So, unless you put d equal to upper critical dimensionality, this relation will not be valid with those values right and then indeed it is valid because if you put this equal to half and that equal to 4 then and this equal to 0 that is perfectly consistent. Okay. Yeah, but the well it will work okay two statements here one is that this relation here for it to be valid with mean field values you got to put the upper critical dimensionality here. The second point is it is a separate problem to show, separate thing to show that the effect of fluctuations is negligible above the upper critical dimensionality. That is a separate story altogether. Okay. So, this is not on the same footing as the rest of it, that is what I am trying to point out. Okay. So, what we need to do is to pay more attention to fluctuations. This means that our original Landau functional where we just took m to be independent of r is not good. To include fluctuations, you have to allow the fact that the order appears in patches of size xi typically, which gets larger and larger as you approach criticality. So, we need to create a functional that will be the Ginzburg Landau functional in which we have to put in the spatial dependence of the order parameter in some coarse grain fashion, not at each lattice site, but when you coarse grain it into blocks of say size equal to the correlation length, then we should be able to get an effective free energy functional or Landau functional, which includes spatial variations here and we will see what happens when we do that. Again, we use very general principles, we will use the symmetry arguments, we will use the fact that we want a scalar, etcetera, etcetera. Yeah, there will be dependence on the correlation length in the indirect kind of way. Yeah, sure. It will certainly appear. That. So, that will be the next step. To, before we do time dependence, we will do that. Okay. Then the kinetics of this transition is something we have not talked about at all. That will be the last thing we do, where critical slowing down will appear. Just as uh, the length, uh, the correlation length diverges, the correlation time also diverges. So, things slow down at the critical point and it will create its own exponent. We need to get, uh, we need to deal with that as well. Yeah, 
that will be the time dependent Ginzburg line. And then we have to include fluctuations in it, which we will with a random force and we will be back to our Langevin model. So, but this time for not a single particle, but for the order parameter itself. So, the basic ideas are very straightforward, very simple, but the implementation and then the renormalization group is something I haven't talked about here at all. We don't have time for that, but that's a separate uh, story altogether. Okay. All right. So, let me stop here today. <laughs>